So, uh, welcome everyone to uh, uh, our webinar. Uh, what's, what VCs actually look at before investing in an online marketplace. My name is uh, Emil Andersen and I am the marketing assistant here at Becero. And as most of you, I hope, already know, uh, we at Becero, we work with content moderation. Um, we're helping online marketplaces across the globe to ensure uh, quality of their user generated content through AI and uh, human expertise. We've been doing this for 16 years um, and we have a global coverage with offices in six different locations across the, uh, across the globe. And I am joined today with the uh, investors uh, Daniel Hoffer and Matthias Ockenfels. Um, and Matthias, uh, do you care to start by introducing yourself? Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me, first of all. It's also sunny here in Berlin, as you can see. That's why I put the shades down, so I hope you guys can still see me. And thanks for participating so so numerous. I can also see in the poll already that, uh, yeah, it's kind of exactly the, the target group that we were aiming for and we hope to be helpful uh, for. Uh, quickly on myself, I've been basically investing into and building uh, online marketplaces uh, for the last uh, 10 years. In, in different roles, uh, mostly on the investment side, working for different VCs, um, uh, most notably uh, Point Nine Capital before, and then also uh, on the more strategic side for NASPERS doing uh, mergers and acquisitions for them. And then uh, I recently had the chance to uh, yeah, set up uh, a fund together with uh, Speed Invest. Uh, that is fully focused on uh, online marketplaces, basically any business uh, enabled by network effects that we call uh, Speed Invest X, and the X stand for network effects. We set that up a couple of months ago, and uh, we also have uh, uh, Dan on board, which is great. And uh, yeah, happy happy to be here today, and uh, yeah, happy to answer also any questions that you might have. Thank you. And Daniel, uh, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so, uh, so I am a managing partner at Crux Capital, um, and I also work uh, with Matthias at Speed Invest from uh, from time to time on a uh, uh, kind of in an advisory uh, capacity. Um, Crux Capital is a new uh, seed stage firm in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're actually still fundraising, so not making uh, investments quite yet um, out of the fund, but um, uh, but I make the occasional angel investment uh, on on the side and in uh, uh, seed companies with traction. Um, also used to run a travel website called Couchsurfing.com, which is a uh, global uh, travel community, um, and uh, former uh, product executive at. Uh, Concur and Symantec and EIR at uh, Benchmark. Great, um, thank you. As you all hear, these two guys uh, have are true marketplace experts and they have extensive experience uh, in our industry. Um, I will share the results from the poll uh, now, uh, so you all can see. Let me know. You guys see it now, right? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, we see that a lot of you guys listening are in the seed stage, but we also have some in the pre-seed and some that are not looking right now. Uh, so this is good for our uh, speakers, Daniel and Matthias, to know as we continue through the webinar. Uh, let's have a look at today's agenda. Uh, we will touch uh, on these eight topics today. Uh, we will look at uh, the problem uh, market, team, product, business model, competition, traction, and fundraising. So we will jump straight into this. Uh, I'll just make our videos a little bit bigger. Here we go. Um, so uh, most startups uh, emerge from a problem. Uh, so how does investors look at this and how does a startup sort of justify the problem that they that they claim they have? Uh, maybe Matthias can start us off. Sure. Um, I think what's 
the most important point on, on this one is to actually uh, point out and explain that it, this is an important problem to solve. The problem that you are tackling as a startup and that you are trying to solve with your product is actually a big problem and it is a real problem that people have. And I think it always sounds easier than it is because in, in, in a lot of cases, it's just a, um, how to say, like a fake, fake problem or you're just coming up with something to, to create a problem that doesn't really exist to then be able to solve it. And I think this is, uh, uh, is, is the worst problems to solve. You should solve real problems that real people have and that needs to be that need to be solved and that actually are big problems so that means that you are addressing uh and actually a large enough and big market and i think that's something to always to always keep in mind i would um <clears throat> one one of the the questions that people ask is are you uh are you solving a pain point um is it is it a, is it a pain or are you, are you providing medicine or are you providing a vitamin um and and the idea is that if you have you know if you're suffering from cancer you need you know a lot of medicine and, and related treatments and that's pretty important um whereas a vitamin is less critical um that's one way to think about pain uh but not the only one because i think that if you look at a company like facebook or twitter um you know at first glance you might not consider it necessarily solving a pain point um and so i actually think that a lot of vcs passed on uh facebook for example because it didn't seem like it was solving a pain point um so uh so sometimes you need to um so i, I completely agree with Matthias that it's, it's important to uh, you know be accurate and truly identify a pain point um, but the pain point is not always obvious um, and sometimes there are pain points that are less obvious like with Facebook so Facebook the pain point was um, you know insufficient uh, opportunity for for human connection um, and for for deeper human connection and sharing um, so uh, and, and that was manifested in people, you know, posting photos of themselves on, on the interwebs. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, our, our job as VC is, is to try to think intelligently about things like that. Um, your job is to uh, figure out what, what your pain point really is um, and make sure that you're capturing it accurately um, and, uh, and also that it is uh, significant pain. Um, yeah. And, and enough to warrant building a business around. Yeah, I think maybe to to add to that one one point is uh, a lot of people often, or what we ask ourselves when we look at a company is, is it uh, a standalone product or is it just a feature? And the, the, as Dan said, does it warrant like its own business and is it big enough for for supporting a whole business basically? And you might basically start out from a feature perspective but there has to be the potential and the vision to turn this into into a fully fledged product sometimes it's also the, it doesn't warrant its own uh standalone business so to say and you just bu build something that maybe optimizes an existing product but it's not worth it to to build a whole business on top of it and um i think this is really to what you really have to point like really have to build out and explain is how um, how are your customers working and how are you helping them how you're making their lives better and and ideally in the in a, in a very simple and uh, in a simple way that investors like us who don't have a clue at the end of the day see a lot of things uh, easily understand it quickly without having to uh, I don't know fully deep dive into and have the same level of understanding of the industry that you as a founder have, right? Because yeah. um, I think we cannot be experts in every industry that we look at, obviously. We will try to be once we decide to, to have a closer look, but stupid guys, so to say. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's great, uh, great insights. Uh, let's uh, move on to the next topic, uh, uh, which is uh, the market. So um, when a startup, uh, what's important for a startup to consider when they're targeting a market? Is, is it market size or what should they look for? 
Um, Daniel, maybe you can start this time. Sure. So, so market size is uh, unquestionably important, um, and 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 it's important for a few reasons. Um, so, first of all, VCs. The profile of a VC-backed company is that the way the VC industry works is that unfortunately um, most startups fail, and as a result, uh, for for an investor to be able to make the money that their fund requires, um, even just to just just to break even, um, they need uh, you know one or two really big winners um, in each fund. Of course, the number varies depending on the funds and the size of the funds and so on. Um, but they need some really big winners in order to make up for all the other companies that um, that shut down. And and the significance of that is those big winners need to get really big. And if you're dealing with a small market size, then you can't get that big. Um, so VCs typically look for um, market sizes in the billions or tens of billions of dollars um, domestically or globally. Uh, if you're under um, $5 billion in, in market size, that's, that's small um, from a VC perspective. And the other factor is, you know, you might think, well, I'm a seed stage investor. My my valuation is, you know, three million or something. And I, if I can sell it for a hundred million, that would be uh, a lot of money for the uh, for the investors. But but you're only thinking of seed investors in that case, um, because as you think about raising a Series A and a Series B, um, and just going down that path then the valuation would presumably increase. So maybe by the time you get to a Series B or a Series C, the valuation is going to be around 100 million. And at that point, if you sell for 100 million, nobody makes any money. Um, uh, at least the, those investors don't, don't make any money. Uh, and so as at the seed stage, you're thinking not just about what's happening now, but several rounds ahead. Um, and the VCs are thinking that they need to fund companies that are going to be able to successfully raise subsequent rounds of financing. Um, and if the companies they back can't raise a Series B down the road, then that's very limiting to, to the potential that can be achieved. So that's a long explanation, um, but, but that's why market size is important and why market size needs to be very large. Um, and you can, uh, you can segment the market in, in both uh, domestic market size and global market size. Um, and obviously, if you're talking on a global scale, that will that will always increase the, uh, uh, the potential market. Uh, I think taking into account what Dan has said, it's like it's always important that you paint a big enough vision for your case to be able to deliver VC style uh, a VC style outcome, right? That is enough for a VC. And I think what a lot of and it's an easy check, quick check for a VC or relatively easy compared to all the other checks that we need to do to basically do a quick bottom up and top down analysis of the market and come up uh, with a number. And if that number is uh, is too small in comparison, then it's probably already a reason to to not do it. Or maybe we are not thinking large enough, which might not, might also be a reason, right? If you looked at Uber in the beginning, I think there were some people quoting the total size of the existing taxi market as the or cap market for as the market potential and total addressable market for Uber, which obviously was totally wrong because they would be increasing the market significantly. Right. Yeah, and, and and actually actually Matthias, I, I think I think Sequoia passed on the basis of market size. Um yeah. they, they were thinking of just the black premium taxi market. Exactly. The, size of the limousine mm -hmm. market. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. thinking creatively about how the market can be more than just what you're doing today is important. Yeah, exactly. But Go also ahead. give investors uh, some pointers on how they can think it bigger. And uh, yeah, and then I think what a lot of I really just want to emphasize it because I often run into this issue when talking to founders is a lot of people take it as we are dismissing their entire business or that this is not a viable business when we pass because we say the market is too small. It really means that this business may, be, may not provide for VC uh, returns and, and a VC uh, outcome, but it still might be a nice business and it still might be a sustainable, viable business. It might just not be that 
billion dollar company, right? And I think that's important to understand that it doesn't mean that it's this is not a viable business at all. It's just maybe not a business that applies to these VC rules, right? Yeah. I just want to emphasize that you can also build a different different type of business, of course, which is totally valid, but then just don't try to raise VC money. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I was Great. pitched recently by a, a founder who was very excited because he was pretty confident he could sell his company for 25 or $30 million. And, yeah. you know, he probably owned, he was a solo founder, so he probably owned, you know, 80% of the company or something. So that would be great for him. Um, but for the stake that I would get um, as a seed investor with, with the check that I put in, it would not be meaningful for, for me or my fund. Yeah. yeah, I think what's what's super important is that basically the way how we look at every company, and that is, I think is for, for any, VC or early stage VC you would be talking to is that they look at a at one company being a potential fund maker, which means our stake in the business at the time of the exit is worth one time the size of our fund. So let's assume that at the time when we exit, uh, just for the sake of doing the math, we still have 10% in the business that already factors in some dilution over time. And let's say uh, in our case, for example, fund size is 50 million euros, then that means that the business needs to be worth and valued a half a billion, 500 million at the time of the, of the exit so that our stake in the business returns one time our fund. If we have three, four of these, we deliver a decent performance on our fund because then we three to four X the fund, uh, right? And that's the math, the, the game also that VCs are playing basically. And right. I think that is what a founder always have to take into consideration. So yeah. also the size of the fund that you're raising from defines the pressure you have in terms of what you need to deliver at the end of the day. If you're raising from a 500 million fund, they have a quite a different uh, expectation also to how much you need to be worth versus a smaller fund, right? Uh, from that point of view. Great, great. Thank you, uh, Matthias and uh, Daniel. It was super interesting to know about the markets and the market size. Uh, it needs to be uh, big enough to for VCs to be to, to for it to be interesting for VCs to invest. Uh, we have to move on to the next point, um, which is team. And I think uh, uh, most of us uh, that uh, are listening realize that early stage investors just like you guys uh, need to put a lot of value into the team uh, before investing but more concretely what do you guys look in the, into a team and how do you evaluate them uh, any of you can go first <laughs> um yeah maybe I, let me give it a try i think it's it's kind of the obvious things it's it's a lot about having a very complementary skill set among the, if it's different founders, ideally it is multiple founders. There's always a certain risk purely from a VC point of view associated with a single founder, uh, because if, the, if that person leaves, you essentially the business is left all alone, right? So you prefer a setup where you have multiple founders, ideally with different complementary backgrounds, technical business, sales, marketing uh, and so on ideally people with deep domain expertise so they know what they are talking about the people should know the business better than we do right if 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 i wouldn't be investing into someone where i have the feeling i i i am better at this or i understand the business better than the person does because then i would do it myself and there's no point in investing into uh into the founder into that person and um i think this you need to bring across and this you need to communicate and and then obviously i think one very important part is that um in in the very first place founders need to be good salesmen uh, in my view why because you need to not only sell to your customers but you also need to sell internally to your employees uh, to keep them motivated to potential new employees and on board convince them to invest into your company keep the business afloat keep growing so i think this component of being a good salesman and and having the sales dna no matter what business you are in b2b b2c is is quite important uh, uh for uh yeah for general like founder profile 
Anything you want to add, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I, I look for um, signals of awesomeness. Uh, and that can take any number of forms. Um, so, you know, some, sometimes people uh, wonder if, you know, they should have gone to a certain school in, in the US. You know, does it matter if they went to Stanford or Harvard? Um, so that that's always nice. Um, I've, uh, I've I've had some good good experiences with uh, Stanford MBAs um, in my portfolio, but um, I also uh, I, one of my best performing portfolio companies. Um, you know, the founder did not go to a school like that, and and he's just an amazing uh, hustler and uh, uh, and CEO, and and his company is doing uh, 200 million a year now in, in sales, um, and so. But what I what I just look for is, you know, do I do I respect this person for for whatever reason? It could be um, something from their uh, from their past and in academic or professional background. Did they work at, you know, McKinsey or Goldman Sachs or something, um, or do they just seem incredibly talented for for whatever reason? Can they achieve things that other people can't? Um, are they are they really unusually effective? um at uh at anything <laughs> um mm -hmm. if, if they apply those uh that those talents and that drive to their startup uh then the startup will do well great well, let's um... maybe quickly to add one thing that i also always ask myself is would i want to work for this person if i were to apply as an employee to the founder to work in his company would i do that and would i also want to work with him as a co-founder or uh also obviously in an investor uh, founder relationship and and if if those questions are positive then that's a that's a good sign yeah, yeah, great uh, if we look at the at the product uh, instead uh, what's important uh, for a startup to consider in this area does it mm -hmm. do you have to revolutionize the entire world or uh, what's important uh, Daniel um does the product have to revolutionize the entire world? Um, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I don't know many products that, that do. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the product needs to um, make a small number of people very happy um, and, and excited and feeling like they can't live without it. Um, that's, uh, that's the most important thing. I think that needs to have a certain disruptive element for sure in the industry. So in general, I mean, it's, it's, it's maybe hard to, to, I don't know, quantify that or, and qualify it, but from a gut feeling perspective, if you're just optimizing an, an existing product a little bit, it's, that's usually not enough. I think what you need to do is like be 10 times better than one, what is on the market already. If you are, going into an existing market. If you're building a completely new product and which is uh, you are a first mover in a, maybe even a new market or opening up a new market segment, uh, that's obviously a, a different uh, question. But uh, breaking into a market that already exists where you already have established players, uh, just building a product that is a little bit better is often not enough. I think what you really need to do is do come up with something that is completely revolutionizing or 10 times better than what is there. And to give you an example, maybe to make it a little bit more tangible, one of our uh, early investments in, uh, in uh, Speedinvest was a company called Spock. Uh, it's a mobile first uh, uh, horizontal marketplace, uh, C2C marketplace in Europe. And um, for example, what they did is there's a lot of classifieds out there, horizontal marketplaces in this world. Uh, uh, be it Craigslist, eBay, uh, OLX, you name it. But um, then being able to uh, use a new technology like smartphones and mobile internet to bring that experience to a tailored mobile experience is something that was 10 times better than was there before. And I think making use of new technology uh, and, and basically use existing business models and adjust them to it to deliver a better experience, customer experience, that is this kind of 10 times better experience that, that I would be looking for when, when looking at a product. All right, okay, super. So 
something unique at least maybe not revolutionize yeah. the entire world yeah, yeah. <laughs> um let's move on to uh the next uh, topic which is uh, the business model so each marketplace uh, i'm sure has its own unique business model and but what kind of questions do you guys look to have answered when you when you look into the business model uh, matthias i think it's um it very much depends on how you can make money at the end of the day. If you think a few years ahead, it's maybe not the most important question at the very beginning when you start out and you just want to build out liquidity and 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 aim to create critical mass. But eventually, you need to see a way of how you could make money, even if it's a few years further down the road. And um, I think what's important here is what a lot of people is funny because just today I was talking to another angel investor about it is it's very easy in a way easy to figure it out because you just have to talk to both participants on your marketplace to both sides supply and demand and figure out what is their kind of margin distribution how much money do they make at, at the end of the day when they sell their products or their services and how much can they afford that, therefore to actually give back to you or maybe if you take away some of the sales and marketing effort that they have to deliver if they would be all on their own then you can tap into that but really understanding that like what is how what is the composition of their margins how much is left at the end of the day and and seeing okay how much can i actually get out of that gives you an idea of how much money you can make and then there's various ways it can be a lead gen it can be transaction based Right, uh, it can be a mix of this. It can be subscription-based. Actually, personally, I don't care. I just want to see that there's the option to do that, and then you can maximize the outcome and optimize around that along the way. And and there's probably, depending on what market you are attacking, who your customers are, there are different uh, different answers to that questions. There's not one like, I don't know, uh, I don't know, uh, safe bet on how to do this, but there's different ways of attacking this depending on what market you're going after. If you're in B2B, B2C, if you, I don't know, it's different when you are in logistics versus when you, uh, I don't know, in the metal space or whatever, right? So I think that really depends, but really understanding on both sides, the margins and how much you can squeeze out of it. I think that is the first thing to do. And very often I ask founders, they have been in this space for two, three years and they still don't know how their clients or the participants actually work. And I think then I already know that they missed something, right? So that's something that you can tackle from the beginning when you start out. Yeah, great. Uh, we are uh, kind of behind the schedule when we look at the time. So I'm sure we will go uh, over uh, the 30 minutes that we said from the beginning. Uh, but uh, I hope you, everyone who's attending will continue to stay because we still have a couple of points to go through. Uh, Daniel, is there anything you want to add uh, on uh, on business model? Yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll keep it short. Um, I think I'll speak to something related, which is uh, go to market strategy. Um, in any marketplace, you need any marketplace by definition has a demand side and a supply side, um, and typically the strategies to acquire and recruit the demand side and the supply side are different from each other. Um, so uh, VCs will typically want to know what your strategy is to acquire both sides um, individually, and then also the economics need to work. Uh, so for example, if you, you know, the, your, your customer acquisition costs uh, collectively need to, you know, be reasonable um, and, you know, track the acquisition costs versus the lifetime value, um, of the customers, but then in addition, if you have a, a sales force or, or somebody doing sales on on either the supply or the demand side, uh, you know, sales force is very expensive, um, and so you know the the average uh, account size um, or uh, or value per customer needs to be quite high to accommodate to cover the cost of the sales force. Um, mm. Maybe you know between ten and thirty thousand dollars a year. Um, depending on the uh, the industry and location and so on. Um, so uh, as you go into the investor meetings, think about um, what is your acquisition strategy for both the demand and the supply side, and feel free to talk about them separately 
um, you could have a, a different slide for each one, for example. Okay, great. I leave the ball on your side, Daniel, and uh, when, when we move on to competition, can you please talk about uh, why it's important to do research on and be aware of your competition and what should they, what should a startup look at? Yeah, so it, it's it's typically a, a red flag if if the VC knows more about your competition than you do. Um, they expect that uh, we expect that that you'll have a good sense of you know you'll, you'll know all the players in the space um, in in much more detail than uh, than we do. Um, and and there are direct competitors, and then there are also substitutes. So for example, right now um, the um, the the dockless bikes are uh, getting very popular and raising a lot of money uh, those companies both in china and then in, in the us um, but there are also scooters that are uh, that are raising a lot of money as well um, so if you're if you're a, a bike company or an electronic bike company um, you might be thinking about your competition as other electronic bike companies but if you think more broadly and think you know not not just who are your direct comp competitors but who can also serve your customers' needs for transportation, um, then you are indirectly competing with the scooter companies and cars and so on. Um, and so that's, that's how VCs will look at a competitive landscape, uh, not just your direct competitors, but any other companies that could meet the same customer need um, that you are addressing. Yeah. I think at the same time, some competition is usually also a good sign because it means that there is, a, in general, um, it's an interesting market and that there is interest in a market. So it's also, in a way, sometimes worrisome if you're the only one, uh, in a way. I think there's an advantage of being the first mover and having, a, especially as a marketplace business, being able to create liquidity faster and, and uh, some basically aggregating everyone and attracting everyone to your uh, marketplace, but uh, eventually it's also a good sign if there's multiple players. And if you look in Europe, for example, we have a couple of uh, food delivery platforms, right? Uh, like uh, Just Eat, for example, Delivery Hero, uh, or t the Takeaway Group, and they are sometimes also competing in 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 the same geographical markets, and they are all unicorns, right? So it's not always necessarily winner takes all. And there's also um, uh, sometimes the opportunity to still build a de decent and nice business as being a number two uh, or, or a number three. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to uh, uh, traction. Uh, and when I hear traction, I'm thinking about financial traction, but uh, uh, it may not be the most important traction that you guys look for. So my question is basically, what kind of traction or even KPIs do you value in an online online marketplace uh, startup, uh, Matthias? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, especially in our case, and 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 uh, I'm talk I think I'm talking here for Dan and and also uh, myself is the, the because of the stage at which we are investing and uh, we're going in so early. There's usually not that much financial traction yet in terms of revenue, uh, real uh, growth and uh, and and uh, maybe net revenue or, or the take rate that uh, the company is achieving. So we are more looking at uh, kind of non-financial numbers, uh, mostly uh, linked to engagement. So how do people use the platform? How many listings do they create? How often do they come back? Do they check the prices and maybe send messages to negotiate or to um, auctioning the the uh, the products or the service, everything, depending on whatever problem you're solving and the use case your product is tailored to and the marketplace is, is tailored to, what is the kind of engagement and, and usage that we would expect, right? And then based on that, uh, measure, you the, measure the company, uh, basically, I don't know if it's a daily usage because it's something you could do every day, you would expect people to come every day, so you would check Based on that, if it's just something that you do once a week, once a month, then you would, uh, uh, yeah, basically uh, look at it from that point of view. So I think that is very much depending on what kind of problem you're solving and what kind of product you're building. And and based on that, uh, basically, we, 
that's our expectation, right? That's framing the expectation also from investors. And ideally, you want to be above that, right? And create some sort of virality, even if, if, if applicable to, to your business. So with every new user, they invite another one or even more, uh, see people coming back. How are daily actives behaving towards monthly actives? You want to have that as a very high ratio. So people come back multiple times during a month. Uh, you want to pe see people on both the sell and the buyer side. So have a high buyer to seller ratio all these kind of things and then it then if people are using it the assumption is that there's you're creating value and you can extract some of that value and make money at the end of the day right sure. <laughs> yeah you can you can if you have anything to add uh, it seems like engagement is the main focus uh, on this well <clears throat> i i would um i i think there for any startup or, or any company there are three pillars three categories of things to think about, um, three metrics. One is revenue, uh, one is uh, number of customers, and one is uh, amount of engagement. So revenue, customers, engagement. Um, for me, I look for, kind of like with, uh, with team, um, I look for signals of awesomeness. So if I, 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 and I think a lot of investors want at least one thing to be going really, really well. Um, if you've got all three things going really well, that's great. Uh, and then it'll be very easy to get funded. Um, but Facebook in the early days uh, had excellent engagement and no revenue. Um, and over time they, they uh, managed to increase customers and then after that they managed to get revenue. Um, so, but you know, at the seed stage, uh, it, it was, you know, um, they certainly didn't have all three. So uh, basically, I need to be able to tell myself a story about how a startup is going to get big. Um, and it starts with uh, one or preferably two of those three things uh, going really well. Yeah, great. Yep. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, move on to uh, um, the last point, uh, which is fundraising. and. Uh, uh, I've read that only 6% of U.S. startups uh, receive, it's around 6% of U.S. startups receive funding every year from VCs and angels. Um, so how should a startup prepare to successfully fundraise? Um, please share some advice uh, to our viewers. Daniel. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, that, that could be a week's worth of discussion. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, I, I think this is the, the fundraising section of, of the talk, so I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, valuation dynamics, um, and which is a, a subset um, at, at the pre-seed or, or seed stage. You know, the, the valuation or the convertible note cap is going to be uh, in the in the single-digit millions, um, and uh, and, and typically what VCs will ask on this front is they'll want to know um, how much money has already gone into the, into the business and, uh, and, and at what valuations um, and, and then want to get a sense of how much you're raising at the new valuation um, that you're raising at. So when, when you go into pitch, uh, you want to come prepared with, with those answers, um, you know, know, know your, your valuation. And also, I, I hear a lot of founders who say, um, you know, that they simultaneously want to get as high a valuation as possible, uh, and also want to work with the very top VCs and have their pick of VCs. Um, I would point out that in some cases, those two things are at odds with each other, because if you want to have as many VCs interested as possible, including your favorites, then you need you need to make the deal as attractive as possible. Um, otherwise, they're not going to be interested. So that means that you should be lowering the valuation in order to attract your favorite VCs, not increasing it. Um, and also, uh, I, I think it's always more important to focus on getting the right people around the table, um, people that uh, you like people that uh, can add value um, because 
these are uh, these are marriages. These are permanent relationships. Um, you can uh, you can divorce your spouse, uh, but you cannot divorce your VC. Um, you cannot uh, easily remove them from the cap table. Um, so it's important to partner with the, the right people for the long term, and and that's worth giving up some uh, in, in valuation, if yeah. necessary. I think it's super important to actually optimize in general more for the long term than for the short term. And unfortunately, I see a lot of founders thinking more short term, also optimizing valuation in the short term at actually maximum valuation at the long term. And and uh, I think they might pick investors on the short term to for the next round just based on the highest price that these are paying rather than the value that they are adding to the company and how they could increase the value of the company in the long term. And and I think that is it's obviously very tempting and I can understand it myself. And you would also think that sometimes uh, the impact of the investors is overestimated and you uh, you think I can do it all by myself and it doesn't matter. But I think as Dan pointed out, this is really for the long term and you want to make sure that you, you work with the right people over a long period of time because especially at early stage, we are in for the long run. When we invest, we, we we know that it's going to be for five, six, seven, if not 10 years that we will sit on the cap table and be there. And you want to make sure that these are people that know what they are doing, that they can help you, that you can rely on, that you want to work with, that you also get along with on a personal level. So uh, I think that is something to also consider. And it's too, yeah, unfortunately not often enough uh, kind of priced into the, the round or the, the valuation. And then in, as the more general fundraising, I think we walked through a lot of points during this webinar that you should all consider and take into account when you prepare. And, I, and, and, and actually that is the, the, my last point, so to say, is like the actual preparation of it. So just go out, start talking and expect people, but be really prepared. So also if there are questions, you can come back immediately. You are, uh, you, you know, uh, you know the answers to the most asked questions. You have your pitch well prepared. There's tons of um, actually information blog posts out there that help you on how to prepare for your fundraising. I wrote a blog post on this topic, for example. Uh, many other great VCs uh, actually wrote about it. Um, so you can read about it. There's tons of templates for your pitch deck out there. So um, I think. You, you should be able to, to find enough guidance to prepare. And then once you're prepared, pick your, pick your partners, approach them uh, uh, with the right material and, and to have also a, yeah, a good conversation with them basically. And, okay. and hopefully your friends and existing partners should help you in preparing it uh, uh, also beforehand. That's also something that we then us every good investor would do actually, right? Once you have them in, and help you with your next funding round, get the material right, get the story right, and so on. Great. Uh, thank you. Very, very nice, uh, very good advice, um, all of it. And I'm sure everyone who's listening is super keen and interested to get started straight away um, <laughs> with all these good advice. Um, the plan was to have a Q&A session now, but since we are over time with uh, quite some time, we have received a couple of questions, and I know you guys want your answers, so. What we will do is that uh, Matthias and Daniel will answer your questions and afterwards, and we will send out to all of you the answers to the questions asked to the, throughout the webinar. Is there, but, is there any, just out of curiosity, is there any questions that I have been asked by multiple people so we could answer them uh, the same one straight away? or? Uh, we have received a lot of different questions, um, so that's why I'm th I think that it might be better that we do it, uh, sure. that we send information to all of you guys afterwards. Yeah. Sure. And before uh, I let you go, I want to invite uh, all of you listening to our webinar. Uh, we have another webinar coming up. It's a short 15-minute webinar where we will introduce our all-in-one content moderation tool, Implio. Uh, it comes ready with uh, uh, with AI, human, uh, sorry, uh, automated filters and a human uh, interface, a uh, good manual interface. Uh, it's free to use up to 10,000 items per month. Um, and it's very easy to scale once you're, 
once your volumes increases. So, um, if you're interested in uh, in improving your user engagement and user user experience, um, and content quality uh, content quality on your um, on your site, then please join us for our webinar on uh, June 18th. Uh, we have also recorded this webinar, so if there are any advice or pointers that you want to go back in time to look at again. No worries, it's all recorded, so um, you can um, you can watch it when we send you the notification email um, once the recording is ready. For the guys who have joined us today, Daniel and uh, Matthias, uh, you can reach Daniel through uh, Crux Capital uh, and Matthias on Speed Invest X. Um, is there anything you guys uh, want to add as a closing remark? No, there's a lot of content out there. Check out our, our Medium channel. We've been writing also a lot about these topics that we've been touching on today. Was was a lot of fun. So thanks for, for staying with us, especially also the European guys. We know it's late already uh, 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 coming uh, to the to the end of the day. So uh, thanks for yeah for having us and thanks for, for staying with us. I do have, uh, do have one thing to add, um, which is uh, Matthias and I organized a conference um, a few months ago called the Marketplace Conference, and that one happened in March uh, in San Francisco. Uh, there's another one happening in November in Berlin, um, and then uh, next year again in March in San Francisco. It's uh, yeah. so twice a, twice a year, alternating between Europe and the U.S. Um, you can sign up to that mailing list at marketplace2018.com. Um, and uh, get notified of them. So once again, that's www.marketplace2018.com. Um, it was sold out this past year um, with 93% uh, um, of people who attended saying they would recommend to a friend, which uh, which was was pretty good for a first conference. And it'll, it'll just keep getting up, going up from there. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. joining. It's awesome. also uh, all the videos from the conference on YouTube, actually, if you want to check it out. I think that's super valuable as well. And a lot of the topics that we talked about also are being uh, addressed in, in those talks. So I think that's that's great. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Matthias, for participating and, uh, and wanting to share your knowledge. And a big thank you to everyone in, in our audience listening to uh, today. You guys have been terrific. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Sure.